in the name of the I am that I am. Praise the Lord. Praise Yahweh. Praise Jehovah. Praise Elohim. Praise the I am that I am. O oh, invincible light of cosmic freedom, we light a torch of praise and thanksgiving for life and protection, for thy mighty circle of the Guru and the Chila, as above, so below, ignite a million hearts and one. Light the one heart that is the heart of God, O living Savior, Sanat Kumara, O living Savior, Gautama Buddha, O living Savior, Lord Maitreya, in Jesus Christ, our twin flames and the saints of East and West, by thy mighty cosmic cube, O living word, seal now the flame of light. Draw thy mighty circle, O Elohim. Draw thy mighty circle, O Elohim. In fire now the hearts, one in thee, Lord Jesus and Kuthumi. With thy invincible understanding, love, power, let the power of the Holy Ghost be the quickening fire. Let the power of the sun be that intensification. Let the power of the Father be now the law of that sacred fire made plain. Light of the Eternal Mother, seal every true Chila on the path. Seal them in the mighty legions of the woman clothed with the sun. O oh, angels of the woman, come forth. Angels of the starry crown, angels of the twelve lights, Elohim come forth, seal now the life, the hearts, the souls of all who are one with us in thy mighty flame. Seal them, O living word, Archangel Michael and your legions of light, establish the word of the world teachers within us. Let God be magnified. 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 In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Please be seated. Today we rejoice in the protection of our community. It is a great moment presented to us as we understand the challenge of following the world teachers, as we understand pursuing the great light of that teaching is the false teacher and the false teaching is black magic, is Satanism and witchcraft, which is purely the pure hatred of Saint Germain that comes as the anti-Aquarian energy anti the freedom of the soul, anti the light of the great prophets. We take a very, very close look at the lesson given to us by the falling of the tree. Here we find that in our midst the appearance of a strong tree, a mighty oak, and yet at the core it is rotten. How much it is like, how much it is like the building up of the civilizations, the mass mechanization of the synthetic ones, the outer appearance.
belying the inner. Here is Jesus speaking of this very situation. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. He reveals in this chapter 10 of the book of Luke the very reason for the sending of the two by two, Alpha and Omega, clearing the way. He gives them a certain empowering of his presence. He will enter those cities. His disciples must go before him as John the Baptist went before him. They must clear the way. They must open the way of the message. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Jesus desires you to carry not only the teaching but the sword of invincible truth, the power of the word for the binding of the wolves, for the freeing of the children. He gives to this first seventy the initiation to carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. We have spoken of the meaning of that initiation of utter reliance upon the Holy Spirit. You are a part of this initiation, though you go in vehicles and you have a certain amount of facilities, material substance that you carry with you. Your reliance, your inner reliance upon the Holy Ghost and your acknowledgement of the emptying of the soul, the soul that is emptied, the soul that must daily be filled by meeting the initiation. He speaks of the challenging of the light. He speaks of being in the vibrations where he would be. And so he speaks of going into the cities and if you are received, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick that are therein. The healing of the sick is a part of your mission in the way that God has appointed, in the use of the spoken word, in the giving of the invocation for the exposure and the binding of the cause and core of the problem and the giving not of a surface remedy, but the transfer of the light and the gift of healing, whereby each one may be accountable and prove the law within himself. And say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God is his higher consciousness. When you say the coming revolution in higher consciousness is here and this is that revolution, you are speaking about that kingdom of God, you're speaking about that light, and you are about the same, the very same mission that Jesus has appointed. But into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. You are become bearers of the kingdom of God, city by city. You become bearers by bearing. You simply go out and say, Lord God, I go out in your name. I desire to be anointed. And when you kneel before the altar of the Holy Grail, you kneel as the knights knelt of old before they went forth on their mission for the raising up of justice and the binding of injustice. 
The world is so ripe to the harvest that Washington, our federal government, is in utter chaos through the chaotic person of the president. All is at the peak of waiting the intercession of the souls of light. The kingdom of God that is come wherever you go is the presence of the entire spirit of the great white brotherhood. When you are a Chila, however new, no matter if you just found the teachings two weeks ago, when you declare yourself to be the messenger of that teaching, you are tied to the brotherhood, you are tied to the spirit, the cloud of witnesses that went before the children of Israel go before you. They go before you indeed. They are there, they are with you, and they are the kingdom that you are bringing. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city, the city that rejects the teachings of the ascended masters. Sit now, sit. <laughs> you have to sit. Sit. The rejection of the one who brings the teaching and the teaching as well brings the karma upon the entire city, the nation, and the planetary body. We understand that karma, and so it behooves us to tie into the heart and the ingenuity of the heart to see that when we present the message, it is not rejected. You're trying to steal the show up here, aren't you? You know, I was, I was reading his mind before I came out here and I, I saw this very determination of his mind that he was going to be on the platform today. <laughs> and I was saying in my mind, no, you can't come on that platform. You're going to distract everyone. <laughs> so he found a way. It's very clear in this message of Jesus, which we have studied a number of times, that the intent of his sending the other 70 is to be testers for his message. Politicians engage people to find out what their popularity is. But the Son of God sends his disciples that they may fall to the right or the left and be aligned for or against the message and the person of the Christ. It is the whole reason for the coming of the ascended masters. And that is a complete change in our understanding and in our consciousness. We somehow feel from the various movements or churches we have come from that the most important thing to do 
is to win people for Christ or win people to this or that organization and to build up many numbers and to somehow uh, expand and multiply and be successful. But really, the purpose of Gautama and Jesus is very clear. They never sought large movements. They had a definite mis mission. It was the judgment of those who opposed the Christ, the Christ newborn infant in the souls of light whom they came to save. And Jesus came to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, those who had come with the Ancient of Days. He had a very clear mission. He came for that group. He didn't come for any others. He came to make them shepherds. He came to have them anointed for judging the 12 tribes. That was his final dispensation in the hour of communion. We're going to share that communion with Jesus today as he gives you the same initiation and blessing, the very same words that he looks to you to be the ones who sit on those 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes, which means bringing the light that forces them to make a choice. So the task is not the popularity poll for the ascended masters, but it is to bring a light in the best way it can be understood by the people whom you meet the most understandable communication that the Holy Spirit in you can put forth so that they may choose in this round, in this 2,000-year cycle. Those people contacted by Jesus and his disciples remained with him for this entire 2,000 years. They were anointed for the entire dispensation and are gathered here again because they listened, heard, and determined to carry his flame. So now we are the ones presenting the message again, and the message takes a new shading. It moves into the light of Aquarius. It has new dimensions. It has a new dynamic. It has a new milieu into which it descends, which is the world scene, the nations, the tremendous amount of amalgamation of power east and west. There are new life waves. There are more souls who have come into embodiment. Many things have changed. And for that change, we find a new Jesus Christ. We find a Jesus Christ who has been an, an initiate on the path for an additional 2,000 years as an ascended master. The Jesus Christ who addresses us today is not the same Jesus Christ who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. What do you think? That you will be the same in 2,000 years? None of us will. This is a very important point that Jesus has made. He has told us that he has increased his causal body, his light, and the path of initiation has gone on for him. And that momentum of his initiation, he stands to deliver to you. Nor can we seal Kuthumi in the matrix of St. Francis or even the matrix of theosophy in which he appeared a hundred years ago. The ascended masters change, and they change rapidly. And they learn lessons from dealing with people on this planet. They make mistakes, and they learn. They learn many lessons, and they devise new methods of bringing people into the light. Saint Germain himself, delivering the violet flame, devised a system for maximum acceleration. He devised the entire way of invoking the violet flame and giving those dynamic decrees. He released the pictorial form of the I Am Presence as a chart. All of these things are the product of the workshops held in the Darjeeling Council of the Great White Brotherhood and the Royal Teton Retreat. And the Ascended Masters have used a maximum ingenuity to apply cosmic law on behalf of an evolution who had certain characteristics. Note the impatience of the West and always the demand for quick precipitation. Many people in the Western nations today would not be able to tolerate a path, for instance, of seven years of silence required by Pythagoras to enter his mystery school. Why, who would stay around for seven years? That inner requirement of the law is yet a requirement. It's the silencing of the entities and the discarnates within the four lower bodies and the learning of the control of the throat chakra and the desire body. 
So how do you meet that requirement and keep your flock following you? Saint Germain has tremendous followers and he has given the dynamic of the decree, the violet flame, its use, a very simple visualization of what is in fact a very complex manifestation, your mighty I am presence. And yet, with strokes of the brush, this painting gives you a force field you can visualize of something that has the intensity and the complexity of an atom itself the nucleus of an atom, a great central sun presence. And yet you look upon it and you see the simplification that takes a great genius, a great cosmic mind to be able to relate infinity to those moving in the finite stream. This the ascended masters have done and they expect their ingenuity to be reflected in their chilas and they expect you to go to the fiery core. We have a student designing coloring books for little children. It's a marvelous system, said Jesus and Kuthumi, because it provides a meditation for the child. The child is very diligent in carefully coloring in the Ascended Master's pictures and causal body. It may take a child anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour to complete a single coloring. In that period, the child's attention has been riveted upon that Ascended Master, that I am presence. It is a complete meditation for a child who needs to be active, who needs to be using his muscles and coloring and doing something creative. And yet there are very few children that you could get to sit and meditate upon a, a picture already painted of Kathumi or of Paul the Venetian hanging on a wall. And if they did concentrate on it for an hour, it would not be with a creative involvement. So the creative involvement of the coloring. There are so many ways and methods to be brought forth by people who are you, creative and exciting. And so here is Jesus with a very important purpose in sending the other 70 and he has a purpose of himself not going because he knows the great reaction of the light to his person. And this is the very same reason that you are being sent. The world cannot take my presence in many instances. People are so uh, agitated by the power and the light that I have to be very careful where I go. But people can talk to chilas and receive the teaching. And so it is a, a question of hierarchy. The light needs to be focused here for the balancing of planetary conditions, for the sponsoring of your two by two mission. So the light must be intense. The light required for that action is too intense for me to move on a one to one basis with people in the world. So they don't need that much light. You have as much night. You have as much light as they need, and any more that you need is added unto you in the course of your service. So here is Jesus sending the other seventy and giving them the manner in which the cities will be judged. Those that receive you receive me. You are to heal them. You are to say the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. You are to call forth the judgment and actually shake the dust from off your shoes where there is a rejection of the light. And I have told you that I witnessed Mark Prophet doing that very thing where he would go and people would spontaneously react against him. He would stamp his feet, shake the dust from his shoes and let people know that he was leaving and that their behavior was not proper. It was an amazing experience to watch this because it didn't matter where it would happen. And I came upon the experience when I had to do the same thing as I was trying to journey from Ghana to Nigeria. And I came to the border of Togo and Benin and they were involved in bribing the Chilas who were driving me for thousands of dollars to allow us to pass over their border. And I would not allow us to be bribed and Moria said, you will not go. He stood in the, in the very path and said, go back and shake the dust from your shoes. And I stood out of the car in front of the, in front of the post of the, um, the border patrol and the customs and I shook the dust from my feet. I invoked the judgment on that entire force field and we got in and we returned to Ghana and I never held a meeting in Nigeria because these two countries would not let me pass by. They would not pass, let me pass through 
and they did not give me the honor of being a representative of a church and therefore not carrying on their blackmail that they deal with everyone who passes by the border. They're always asking for money and uh, you sit there all day and by the end of the day you get the idea they're waiting for, for money, large sums of money just to drive your car through. So that is what must be done. It's not that important that anyone hear you, but you cannot take that human creation with you, so you shake it from your feet, you give Jesus judgment call, and you leave that place where you have been rejected. And you will remember this, you must call the judgment. Heard or unheard, it doesn't matter, it must register in matter. And so, for those who reject the word of the world teachers, Jesus says, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And then Jesus prayed and rejoiced in the Spirit. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Only the Christ in you truly knows the Father, and the Son reveals the Father to you. And unless the Son reveal the Father, you do not know the Father. The purpose of your going forth, then, is to tear the mask from the wolves in sheep's clothing, to cast out devils, and when you go forth victoriously and prove you are willing to go without the supports of material substance, and you come back victorious, Jesus awards you with greater and greater power. And so this is a very important message for today. The realization that going two by two, being an evangel, going stumping is ongoing. And each time you go, you increase in the Lord's wisdom and power. God loves you when you stand before the adversary fearlessly when you bind cowardice and the demons of darkness and you are unrelenting in presenting that message. In my 67 evenings of stumping, I saw a fiery coil increase and grow and intensify and expand because that is the way cycles are. The light always begins as the point of faith in your heart and it is increased and increased and increased and you reach the place where the word itself is such a power in your temple that you no longer tremble before the word. I have heard the master speak dictations through Mark or through me and I fairly shook before the power and the judgment that descended. 
And you know, you even grow to fit into the shoes that God gives you to wear. And maybe the mantle is a little bit big that you received. But you grow to wear it by the very presence of that mantle and those shoes. And you find yourself reaching the peak of the spiral of the word for which you have agreed to be the instrument. And you are seized with a confidence and a determination that is not your own. And the more miracles you see, the more you lean upon that word. We've seen a miracle today for a very important purpose. For the tree that is rotten within, appearing strong on the outside, is like the false hierarchy, like Lucifer, the son of the morning, about whom Isaiah writes, How art thou fallen? The fall is sudden and swift. And the lesson from Jesus and Kathumi upon that tree is that every fallen one who falls and comes to the judgment is determined to take with him the light bearers. They cannot go out alone. They cannot bear the descent and the fizzling out of their energy and the magnetism, the maya of their personality. And the force with which they descend is a mighty impact. It is a crushing blow, and yet in the very presence of its descent, the hosts of the Lord protecting those who are a part of the living guru Chila relationship. The energy that is hurled against this community and the world teachers is specific. It is specifically directed by certain false teachers against certain individuals within and without the community and ultimately against me personally. This is what the world teachers want presented today. And so that sudden descent of Satan like lightning witnessed by Jesus because the disciples went forth in his name is the very observation that became concrete this morning it could have happened in the middle of the night. It could have happened while you are in the sanctuary, but it happened when people were present to see it because it is a far more important lesson than I could give you with mere words. It illustrates the impact of the fall of the arch deceivers and their determination to manipulate elemental life or embodied people against the children of the light. It illustrates just as quickly that protection. So before we begin the explanation of the false gurus in some measure today, we would like to meditate with Excelsior on beloved Jesus and Kathumi and their real living entrance into the sanctuary of your heart.
I guess, speaking of Excelsior, we are very excited about St. Germain's strategy of transferring the coming revolution through music. And the first album, now out with its booklet, is yours to hurl. It's a miracle pouch. This week, as I have left you each day, you've seen me riding away in the car with my supper or lunch in my lap, I've been on the way to the recording studio where Excelsior is making their second album. <laughs> and so there I've been for six or seven hours and uh, usually till the next morning, till 12 or so, and then uh, coming back here. And so I haven't had a moment to do anything else during these two weeks. We've, we've been doing this every day. The album is going to be called Friends of Freedom Arise, Arise. And it will begin with the Great March. In any case, um, the Friends of Freedom Arise, Arise is the theme. And on the album will be songs to many of the Ascended Masters and the booklet an, introdu an introduction to those Ascended Masters so that people can be learning to know who are the hosts of the Lord that are prophesied in the Old and New Testament, what are their names? And Isaiah told us yesterday that God calls every one of them by name. And so we give to the world their names, their music, their songs, their keynotes, and it'll be another miracle pouch. It's a very exciting experience. It has another 24 songs, and quite a number of them you haven't even heard. Music is a very important part of every revolution. The music of the revolution. This music is the real alchemy of the Ascended Masters. So, Jesus sends you forth and he wants you to know what you will be confronting. You hear in general of the wiles and the methods of false gurus. It is important that you hear who they are, what they are, and what they are doing. It is important for you to realize that there isn't a false guru in this country today who does, does not know me and know of me, and many of them read our literature diligently to be certain that they are up on what we are saying and to be able to use it or misuse it as they see fit. Their souls have the inner recognition of the light of the brotherhood and they all know the mystery of the coming of the mother. They understand who the mother is and the mother presence. Their response is absolute stone silence. Those who are false will never speak or never attempt to have in any way any sort of an affiliation, even a friendship, even an openness toward those who are of the light. And they know on the inner planes that in the great white brotherhood they have met their masters. And they know it is a matter of time. And so they do accelerate the hold that they have upon their followers. The particular incident that occurred this morning was followed a few hours later when I was traveling here by a about a six car collision that occurred in front of me on the highway with a semi truck and about five other cars all entangled together. It occurred probably within 10 minutes or so before I arrived there. One of the procedures that I follow is never to speak over the telephone or to uh, involve other people in my daily schedule. You have to have the understanding of your inner alchemy, your purpose and what you are doing and only give out so much information that is necessary for you to accomplish your lecture, your tour, your radio and TV programs and the advertising of those times and dates is important. But when you come and go into the city and where you are, it needs to be known by devotees, but it does not need to be broadcast. Copper is the basis of telephone communication and copper relates and vibrates with the astral plane. 
It's one of the lower metals that you should not wear on your person because it is a conductor, a conductor of lower energy. What you put on the telephone, you're putting out into the astral plane. So you be careful of not using the telephone more than necessary. Obviously, you are not superstitious and you are not hampered, but your awareness of the teaching enables you to be cautious and careful. And when you have an alchemical matrix that you are working upon, you do not give yourself, uh, you do not give your awareness, your press releases to the astral forces. Now, when you are in the closed circle of your light and your I am presence, the fallen ones cannot read what is going on inside of that tube of light. When it is sealed and brilliant, especially when you call for the cloak of invisibility, invincibility and invulnerability, invisibility, invincibility, invulnerability. In addition to your mighty I am presence, each morning you invoke that qualification with Archangel Michael. And as long as you are harmonious, you can move incognito. When you allow wedges of darkness to penetrate inside your force field, your household, your community, it is through those wedges that the fallen ones penetrate. So that is why you have a problem when people are out of alignment with the light of the community and they are allowed to remain. They become the open door. They themselves may not be malicious, but when you have people out of alignment with the teachings, the teacher and the way of life and in some form rebellious, you find that their presence near you becomes the opening of a much larger energy, which is the mass consciousness, the collective sinister force of the planet. The collective sinister force then has various individuals within it. There are individuals who are conscious of this movement and of me and of you, and there are those who are not conscious. Those who are conscious can be played upon by entities and demons to intensify their hatred now, there really is no reason why people should viciously hate you or me or the light. But they do so because they are put upon by hordes of wandering demons who are threatened by the coming of the light. So these demons and discarnates will come upon relatives and friends and get them all upset and all excited and you'll find an intense amount of energy building up often over nothing. So the individuals who are actively engaged as the funnel of hatred attempt to work through on the inner levels, whether consciously or unconsciously, any weak link. So when you have sympathy for people who are rebellious or, psycho or psychic, who constantly come to your meetings and only come there to get the light and really have no commitment, no real love for the masters of the teachings, they disturb your meetings and uh, they are in, not in any way showing the fruits of a life that has been transformed by the light and you continually allow them in your household and in your meetings, it is they who become the open door for the breaking up of groups and force fields. And so you find through years of experience that sympathy with the fallen ones and allowing of people to remain who have shown their rebellion and their utter disdain for the brotherhood does nothing but not only weaken the movement, but it is capable of destroying it if it goes unchecked. So I found that that uncompromising stand for the light has to be the signet of our community. And this is why we have what we have. You find the peace, the light, the dictations, the Holy Spirit here because it's a no-nonsense community. If we let in everyone, we could have the whole world here. The whole world wants Camelot, but they don't want to pay the price for the sacrifice. So we don't let the whole world in. We let anyone come in and have the opportunity of hearing the teaching, but once they make their decision, they either have to be in or they have to be out as far as living within the community of Camelot. So I want you to remember that because many times when you suffer opposition, it is not because of karma, it is not because of anything you have done wrong, it is because somewhere within your life or within the group of people you're with, there's an open door. And an open door can be one that is naive and ignorant and surely not a part of the intensity of the hatred of the outer sinister force. So this, this accident that occurred along the highway, the vibration was clear. It was intended 
to intimidate me intended to happen just as I was driving there. But of course, the force is not that smart. And that is what you have to understand. The sinister force is not God. The black magicians are not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. And you have far more of God consciousness and the ability to overturn them than they have to work against you. That is, if you're fearless, uncompromising, and refuse to indulge in superstition. If you're superstitious, you're operating right on the level of the psychic uh, plane, and you will be subject to such nonsense of witchcraft and black magic. So do not be superstitious, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We give our decrees because we need them. The world teachers want you to know that the incident of the falling of that tree was the intensity of the hatred of a false guru by the name of Yogi Bhajan. Yogi Bhajan has had a hatred of me and this activity for years. He has felt the threat of it. I gave a lecture in Hawaii a number of years ago, I think at least five years ago. It was at a New Age conference where he had also spoken. He sat there. And before I spoke, he greeted me warmly, expressed his condolences at the passing of Mark Prophet, assured me that he knew that I would carry on and that he knew I would make it. He took my hands in an expression, a gesture of greeting. And as he held my hands, he looked down upon them and he saw the energy focused within these jewels that St. Germain as entrusted to my care. He looked at them and he looked at me and the last words I ever heard him speak to me were, oh my God. <laughs> he sat down with a few of his followers. I took the platform and delivered a lecture and a dictation from Lady Master Venus, which was very powerful somewhere in the midst of which he walked out with his followers. The, whatever her name is, the, the leading witch of the country also walked out and said in the hallway that the energy was too intense. From that moment on, he was totally and entirely hostile. Before that conference, he invited me to speak at a conference he was holding in New Mexico. And after that, he would have nothing to do with me and did not want any part of me coming to his conference. Well, following that conference, there was a tornado-like hatred uh, in the islands that I felt come down upon me. And I knew it was from him, and I knew it was the utter condemnation of this individual who recognized the force of light that would be ultimately his undoing. Not me, I'm not anyone's undoing, but the force of the Great White Brotherhood, the sponsoring light. It is the sponsoring light. And so, over the years, both before and after that incident, various people have left Yogi Bhajan's movement. And some of those have joined this organization. And evidently that has con concerned him considerably, but recently our two devotees that have come to this two-week seminar, it seems that this has caused a great stir with Yogi Bhajan and he feels very threatened. He has the intensity of a death wish upon me and anything that's upon me is upon you. It is more or less understood among his followers that the betrayal of him as the guru is fraught with dire consequences even to the death, even extending into subsequent embodiments. I have felt this death wish and our staff has united in uh, many vigils and hours of invocations and decrees during this period of two weeks. Jesus and Kathumi elected to wait until you have heard all of the teachings and are prepared to go forth and then to tell you that you must realize that when you represent them you stand before them and the attack against them will be the attack against you 
And this is why the guru makes this pledge to you. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. He that despiseth you, despiseth me. The ascended masters know that you are taking a stand against every imposter of their office. They will not leave you without defense or protection. They will place their mantle and electronic presence over you. They will be yourself in action. You will be them in action. Such is the pact that they make with those who have the courage to bear the burden of their cross. That is what Saint Germain told me the day that he gave me the anointing to be a messenger and placed that robe upon me. He said, whenever you are in need, whenever you are under opposition, say the word, Saint Germain, I bear thy cross. When you say the word that you are bearing the cross for Saint Germain, you have the full mantle of his protection. It's a covenant you make with him. You agree to stand for him, to give forth his name without compromise, never to withhold it, never to be embarrassed, to proclaim your guru's name. And with the speaking of his name, you have the fullness of the momentum of his flame, his electronic presence upon you. So the cross of Saint Germain is world hatred. Hatred of love, hatred of Aquarius, hatred of freedom, hatred of the Father of Jesus Christ, hatred of the man, the masculine being. Every false guru today upon the planetary body ultimately hates Saint Germain. And the hatred that you get or that I get is a measure of that hatred. Now that is the one o'clock line of our assignment of world freedom. We come to the two o'clock line of Jesus Christ the line of the world teachers. When we say, beloved Jesus and Kathumi, I bear thy cross, we're bearing the momentum of planetary fear, doubt, human questioning of the teacher and the teaching. Doubt and fear and human questioning of the teacher and the teaching. And finally, the entire momentum of the planetary records of death. When Jesus carried that cross on the two o'clock line, the third station, he fell. He fell for the first time under the weight of the death momentum of the planet. Kathumi stands with him today, and because we collectively bear that cross, we are determined we shall not fail in the name of the world teachers. Because we bear it collectively, we should not fall beneath the weight of it. Together, we ought to be able to bear our master's cross, our master's world karma. And what did we learn is the meaning of the word burden. It is the message of the judgment. Remember that. The message of the judgment that Isaiah brought was his burden. The burden toward Babylon, the burden toward Philistia, the burden toward Assyria. The weight of that judgment is what you carry and it is meted out moment by moment through your entire life until you ascend wherever you go. That light is the light you carry and when it meets the darkness that alchemy is a burden in itself. So what you find in the situation of Yogi Bhajan is that he knows that his time is come. I understand that he has boasted that he was near death and that his students prayed for him to live and that he owes his life to his students. He was near death because of the karma he made for misrepresenting the true guru, Guru Nanak, whom he professes to represent in the order of the Sikhs. Guru Nanak, a great soul of light, founded that order. I saw Mark Prophet at the shrine of Guru Nanak in India, and I saw him acknowledge his inner tie and his oneness with him as carrying the mantle of the brotherhood. But Yogi Bhajan is an imposter of that lineage and of that descent. And so he has misrepresented the teachings. He has not the sponsorship of the Great White Brotherhood to teach Kundalini Yoga or Tantric Yoga. He has no inner light or attainment to transfer that real and living teaching. And he has refused to submit to Saint Germain, whose new dispensation is for every school East and West. All schools of the Great White Brotherhood must come under Saint Germain, under Sanat Kumara, and what is given for the Aquarian Age. 
What they take is the oldest dispensation. They are very familiar with it. Hinduism is an old path, and because they have it, Hinduism down pat in their consciousness. They have yoga. They have a certain adeptship in the physical body. They have the Sanskrit language. They carry with them all the customs of India. And there is an adevity on the planet whose heart does not yearn for the motherland Mu, now the focus of which is in India and truly in the United States of America. So India takes us back to the root of mother. And therefore, many of these teachers coming out of India have capitalized upon the faint memory of the 144,000 of their origins in Lemuria and in the temples of the Himalayas. So the longing for India, its customs, its food, its religion, and the real teachers there has allowed the American people, especially this generation moving into Aquarius, to fall prey to these charlatans who have never had it so good. They do not have such followings in their own country. They are seen for what they are, but they come here with all of the trappings and the image of the Eastern path and those who find nothing in the watered down version that the fallen ones have seen to it we have in, in the West of Christianity and Judaism. Those people who are the older souls flock to these false gurus. Their day is done, they are exposed, and those who are their followers, many of them, are in fear of the consequences of leaving them. This fear is indeed engendered by Yogi Bhajan. Because he knows his time is up, he therefore must prove to those who remain with him that his word is law. And he is very intent on seeing to it that they will know that Anyone who leaves him will suffer a dire calamity. That is the word he has put forth, whether subtly, whether overtly, it is definitely understood. It is a threat. And so this day, the manipulation of elemental life was intended to prove to this community that he himself was more powerful than the ascended masters. It's the very test that Elijah had on Mount Carmel. Even in the absence of my person, you saw the hand of the brotherhood. How important it was that I was not here physically so that you could realize that the guru is always present. The, the chila and the guru circle is always complete. We are always one. The ascended masters are always with you. And it is by your word that you are saved. Your word as commitment to the path and your word as the dynamic decree. It is a very joyous moment for me to see the action of the law, the sponsoring mantle, and yet it really works independently of any of us. The law is both dependent upon us for reaching the people and entirely independent of us. And it's a wonderful understanding. The teachings of the, of the ascended masters bind you to God, to your mighty I am presence, to your Christ self, and to the servants on high. They always do, and they always prove themselves. So on the way here today, I stopped at the hospital where Mark Chapin was, and at first the doctors had said he had a cracked skull and all things wrong with him. They took the x-rays. By the time I was there, and they had been waiting long for the x-rays, he was standing on his feet with only a, a small amount of soreness, feeling completely well and wholly delivered from that experience. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 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 I would like you to observe the attempt to manipulate elemental life. I saw the Swami Rama, one of the arch deceivers of long standing on this planet, come to our property in La Tourelle and by his black magic manipulate elemental life to create a snowstorm in the fall 
ruin the crops of the state, millions of dollars worth of damage, and take an apple and put into it the substance of his own black magic, which might have been anchored in the substance of mercury itself, and use the apple which he intended for Mark and me to eat. He used this apple that he plucked from the tree in the middle of this snowstorm, an apple ripe to the harvest, presented it to me, told me I should eat it. I was preparing food for him and other guests in the middle of a conference. I set the apple down, didn't have time to eat it, and I came back into the room and I found that two people who were in a fastly becoming tied to him in an idolatrous relationship had devoured the apple. And he came into the room and he was very, very upset that they had eaten the apple. And he chastised me and said, why didn't you eat that apple? That apple was for you. Well, I looked at the apple when he had given it to me and I had no desire to eat it. Well, in any case, they did and they were totally bound to him psychically from that day forward. They left the ascended masters and followed him out the door and interestingly, uh, many dark things befell them. But here is a, a black magician manipulating his heart, stopping his heartbeat, and using uh, the, the sexual energies, uh, sleeping with the people who come to him, uh, enticing women and men to use Hinduism for the heightening of sexual experience, which is the ultimate hatred of the mother to take Hinduism, which is really a religion of the mother, and to squander the light of the mother, to steal her light, to develop these powers in the third eye, to raise the Kundalini, and to use it to destroy and to entrap souls of light. So the Swami Rama, whose file we have and whose pictures we have, is one of the most dangerous individuals walking the nation. He presents himself scientifically, goes through tests where he stops his heartbeat for any amount of minutes and therefore is proclaimed as a great adept. He is a false teacher to the very core and I cannot tell you how many letters I've received from young women who've been in his circle, who've been seduced by him, yet he professes celibacy. He is dark to the very core. Dark and dishonest, manipulative, but his deeds are not the ultimate darkness. It is the hatred in his heart, the extreme hatred of the light and of the messengers. So in terms of examining this a little bit more specifically, Monroe is going to talk to you about Yogi Bhajan at this time. I'm also hoping that Wayne and Audrey will talk to you as well. You can decide. First thing I want to say is um, being a participant and yet an observer on the series of events, the stream of events that have occurred in the last few weeks, uh, it's very clear to me, uh, statement that friendship with God is enmity with man. Uh, I have observed Mother's disposition in this entire matter, as well as uh, the Church's position regarding uh, Yogi Bhajan. And I have to say that uh, we have followed for many, many years an injunction which El Moria gave to us so long ago, even before I joined the activity. He told Mark and Mother that they were to paddle their own canoe, that they were to do what they knew best and to uh, raise the banner of the teachings of the Ascended Masters and the Great White Brotherhood and let truth be its own witness and its own defense. Uh, this was in uh, re uh, response to an effort which they had made to contact groups to hold some kind of a symposium uh, in the early days of the activity here in the West Coast with a lot of other um, New Age type activities, none of whom responded to that invitation. And that formula has been followed ever since. And uh, it was true in this case that 
there was no intent, active or passive, uh, on mother's part or the master's part, well, I won't say on the master's part, but on mother's part, there was no intent to secrete uh, out of Yogi Bhajan's uh, activity individuals, no deliberate enticement to uh, Wayne or Audrey to leave the activity and to come under the wing of the brotherhood, not in any competitive sense whatsoever. Wayne had chosen many, many months ago to attend a stump, I think two stumps, in Minneapolis, at which time he made the decision to begin practicing the science of the spoken word. Unbeknownst to him at that time, his wife, who was with child, uh, was told personally by Yogi Bhajan that if Wayne continued to decree that the child would not be born. Uh, he said in so many, um, so many words to her on, on the telephone, that the child would, would never be born uh, if, number one, they chose to continue decreeing or uh, chose to give the child a name themselves rather than to accept his name for the child. Uh, Audrey, being the strong soul that she is, made the decision not to even uh, trouble Wayne with that little bit of information until she got here a few uh, days ago, at the beginning of this retreat. So uh, they've been out in Iowa, I believe, on their own, uh, without hardly any contact with us that I know of since those last stumps last fall, except that Wayne chose to come to the conference this July, the Freedom Class, and hearing the invitation of the world teachers, decided to stay on. And at that point, everything kind of broke loose, as the saying goes. and. Uh, Yogi Bhajan became very animated and uh, had two personal interviews with Audrey in New Mexico where he told her that uh, mother could not possibly be a true teacher or a true guru because she was a woman. And when had a woman ever been the head of any true spiritual activity? Uh, he told her as well Uh, told her as well that um, Summit University was simply a money-making scheme for our movement and why would anyone ever want to come to our, our school when it was just a, uh, a commercial enterprise. Um, he made aspersions about Wayne at that time saying that he was becoming more and more effeminate and that uh, he had uh, tendencies toward homosexuality and that he was gravitating to mother because she was a woman and she was, he was polarizing with her feminine polarity and that if Wayne did not return, he would become homosexual and it would split up their marriage and, and so on and so forth. So Audrey believed all of this at the time because she had not um, the comparison of the light and the experience here. And so it was agreed between her and Yogi Bhajan that she would come out here and bring Wayne back with her. <laughs> and so uh, she came, and uh, she was not here even 24 hours before she had uh, received enough of the light of the Masters and enough witness personally of the, the truth of the teachings of the, the Brotherhood and of the authenticity of Mother's Messengership to where she personally renounced the uh, tie that she had to Yogi Bhajan. She renounced the name which uh, she had chosen from their order, as did Wayne, and uh, took off their turbans, all of which were symbols of the renunciation of that path. And, uh, of course, this again was sending shockwaves throughout the 3HO organization nationwide because Wayne is the head of one of the ashrams uh, in their home and is known among uh, the national leadership of the organization. So to so have someone of that stature in their minds and defect is quite a serious matter. Now, uh, since they arrived here, they have been uh, subjected to a continual bombardment of phone calls, 
people have come to the gate at Camelot on one or two occasions, once in Yogi Bhajan's personal car, and uh, wanted to speak with the, uh, the Larsons. Now, uh, they, did not, they were not allowed to speak with them, and uh, we went on and uh, let them send one communication to the uh, ashram in Los Angeles to the effect that they were not, they were renouncing their path of the, the uh, following of Yogi Bhajan and his form, his version of uh, Sikhism, and that they were not going to be out of our retreat, they were not going to communicate until the retreat was over, at which time the, the, everyone in the 3HO would be hearing from the Larsons about their story. Um, Yogi Bhajan has a great deal of animosity. Uh, Audrey told me this morning that uh, he said any number of times that people who uh, defect from the path return as cockroaches, return as toads, return as other forms of animal life, degenerate animal, animal life, and are condemned to hundreds or thousands of incarnations uh, in these, these forms. So this is the kind of club of fear, you might, uh, instrument of fear, which he holds over his uh, followers. It's quite an unfortunate matter. Um, their child has not really slept for many, many nights, and they themselves have had a great deal of problem. I didn't know this at the time I was talking to you, but Audrey had walked under that tree about two minutes before it fell uh, by that very, very spot. And so um, Yogi Bhajan, uh, this past week, made an unscheduled three-day trip to Los Angeles and uh, held some meetings downtown. Um, it's very interesting the way that their organization is gravitating right now. I, I have a picture here I'd, I'd really like to show you. of uh, the kind of consciousness which is developing there. This, they have a uh, journal of their teachings which uh, shows the way of life of their membership. And uh, we'll put this maybe in the back on display so you can see it later. But here is a, a typical uh, chila of the Sikh uh, movement in, in America today, decked out in all of his regalia. And I'll describe that regalia to you from the top down. It begins with a turban, which has around it a, uh, a kind of a band made up of steel uh, balls formed into a chain. And then there is a, uh, around the gentleman's waist, he has two daggers, two uh, daggers that look to be about a foot or a foot and a half long each. They're called capons. Now, I've had it explained by the Larsons that uh, Sikhs, even in India, are expected to have some symbol of this dagger on as one of the uh, traits, uh, one of the characteristics of their faith. Normally, it is in the form of a small ins uh, insignia on a bracelet or another piece of jewelry. Uh, and not, n not normal, at least in uh, 20th century America, for people to be carrying around um, these long daggers, and in addition, in the person's right hand, he holds uh, an old medieval-style pike with a uh, blade and a pointed thing on the end of it. And as I'm, as they have told us, there is a very militaristic uh, strain uh, creeping into Yogi Bhajan's movement. There's another picture in here on the front of one of their covers, where uh, a beautiful little boy is all decked out. He must be about three or four years old. And he also is uh, decked out with his long uh, sword or dagger by his side. Actually, he's n he doesn't have it on his waist. He's actually brandishing a, uh, a curved sword in his hand. So in a sense, here it is. He's not brandishing it, but he's holding it. He looks about three, three and a half years old. And so this is the kind of consciousness which they are currently inculcating into their children. Uh, I, don't, I don't pretend to know all of the uh, tactics of what this is intended to, to uh, convey or, or what kind of control it's intended to bring about. The only thing I can observe, and the thing I must observe, is that if an activity of light 
were to do such things on the street in broad daylight in America today as they are doing, they would be crucified. I, I, I was flabbergasted to imagine how they could be dressing like this and getting away with it without the, the press just beating it into the ground. I mean, we've heard about Simonon and the things that they've done behind their closed doors and some other organizations. And here, here's the picture of Yogi Bhajan leading his followers, uh, many of whom have these swords on, down a broad avenue lined with eucalyptus trees in one of our large cities here in, in America. So, I mean, it's not something that goes on in New Mexico out in the desert. It's something that you can see if you went down to one of their free public lectures, as one of our people did this past week. So, it, to me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of how that which is not of the light can get away with things that, that anybody even making any motion in that direction would just be simply crucified for uh, if they were of the light. Um, Yogi Bhajan has um, a stance and uh, a policy of saying that the soul does not enter the womb or enter the child until the fourth month after conception and that because this is true abortion up until that time is uh, simply a clinical matter more or less and so um, he has provided a rationale uh, to uh, abortion up until that, that time. Um, I could go on and on about the things which are a problem. Uh, here to me is one of the most si uh, sinister things, and mothers may comment about this in the past. You see here a very idyllic domestic scene. A mother and a few children uh, seeing, reading a storybook of one of the Eastern Saints. And one of the greatest attractions to the Bajan or to, to 3HO is healthy, happy, holy, is the lifestyle which they offer. I don't know how many centuries old Sikhism is, but it is an entire way of life. It's a culture which has been, at least Yogi Bhajan has attempted to transplant en masse or as one whole entity from India to the United States. And a lot of young people are looking for an alternative lifestyle, as the saying goes, uh, family, an extended family relationship that they can be a part of and uh, live healthy lives, eat good food, uh, do the right disciplines and fasts, live in a community where everyone has the same kind of uh, uh, belief structure. And uh, this whole thing is a ready-made package for the hungry soul to just slip right into. And Mother has made comments about, about uh, organizations, movements, churches in the United States, uh, Mormonism for instance, where they have the same lifestyle, the same family from the earliest childhood up, the, the development of the, the whole uh, maturing of the soul within that movement. And that is one of the greatest appeals uh, for them. Not so much any unique dogma, any unique uh, brand, uh, point of the law. Audrey has told me a number of times since we've met that there's a, a great emphasis on the concept of martyrdom and the willingness of the, uh, the need for the soul to be willing to give its life. But she says the problem is in, in their movement, she's not sure that many people know uh, what the principle is that they're giving their life for. That when she came into the activity, she was searching for truth, searching for the the points of the law, of cosmic law, whereby she could guide her life. And yet, many years later, those points are just as fuzzy in her consciousness as they were when she arrived. Uh, so the point, the tenets of the law are not what are drawing people. It's the lifestyle. It's the c community. It's the family. It's the sense of belonging. And filling those human needs while not having, even though you don't have the bread of life to fill the soul's hunger, because you are meeting the human needs, uh, you maintain a certain outer organization and group of souls. And that is a very insidious thing because it's an inoculation against the, the true uh, nurturing of the soul and keeps, keeps souls from the search, from the going on and searching until they find the teachings of the Ascended Masters. Um, we have the same responsibility to meet those human needs in addition to uh, calling the soul to the path of the ascension.
actually they're, they're one and the same. But we must be very careful to expose these things. Um, another, another point which I wanted to mention is that this energy is something that all of you as well as the Larsons and the mother have been feeling. Not only those who, to whom it is personally directed are impacted by that energy as we witnessed this morning. And the thing that is so, such a delicate matter is to bring issues of this nature before you without it looking like some kind of a resentment or a retaliation or some kind of a critical activity. But we have seen time and time again that to withhold from you the information about what kinds of slings and arrows of outrageous fortune are flying through the psychic atmosphere uh, is really to do all of you a disservice. Uh, it, it does not uh, expose for your calls or for the guard of your consciousness to be in place in order to uh, prevent these things from happening. So that is uh, another part of the reason as to why this instruction is coming forth right now. I'd like to in introduce you to Wayne and Audrey and uh, give them the opportunity to say anything that they would at this point. Would you like to stand up and come forward? You certainly don't have to say something if you don't want to. Thank you. Monroe has this way of synthesizing everything that I wanted to say and has given you a clear picture of exactly uh, what has happened to us and it's had many more avenues and ramifications than, than can be explained. I'm sure everyone has had opposition as to coming here and, and can feel the intensity of the light and the intensity of the darkness which opposes us. There has been a calling in my heart since I spoke with mother and saw mother. I told her of an experience which I had, which I saw and was taken up to see the new Jerusalem, which was coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. And this I know upon stepping foot on Camelot that this is the new Jerusalem. I know that this area is a consecrated area. Our experiences in the 3HO organization has taught us a great deal and I think we're, as we go home to carry the banner of the Senate Masters that we will really find out their mission. We are quite grateful and it's a miracle and it's the greatest miracle in my life is that my wife could come here if you'd have know, known what she had gone through just to get on the plane and, and to arrive here. When I went to pick her up at the airport, she was still so confused that she was heading for another plane to go back to <laughs> Iowa. And I had to literally just take her baggage and get it into the car. And you know, that was my way of, of executing uh, the master's request to, to bring her here. Is there anything you would like to say? <laughs> no. The when we were up in the stump and 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 Satiel, our daughter, was still in inside the womb, and Saint Germain gave the blessing. It was my first indication that there was something very special happening, and both both Audrey and I had had visually come under to the violet flame and was seeing it, you know and was feeling it very intensely. And at the time that we decided to name the child, is an other first indication that there was a great amount of darkness and opposition to the Ascended Masters. And this came with the death, death wish of Yogi Bhajan upon our child. And uh, there was also another call uh, that one of the head uh, regional 
ministers had, had told Audrey, my wife, to. There was a woman who told uh, her to burn all of, of Mother's tapes and books and all the books of the Ascended Masters that we had in our house. And that just opened my eyes even more. And everything else uh, sort of led to coming out here to the Freedom Conference and uh, having a, a short walk and talk with Mother just opened my heart totally. And, uh, and here we are. We're all grateful to all the people on the staff who had spent hours and hours, stayed up nights, got up early in the morning to decree for bringing Audrey and Satyal here, and, and our heartfelt thanks goes out to all of you. God bless you. I don't have a lot more to say except that um, I have observed down through the years that it, it never really pays to withhold the truth when the truth is known. That you pay a terrible price sometimes in uh, people's lives or their opportunity by thinking that you are uh, being uh, gracious or uh, uh, balanced or somehow or another judicious in withholding the truth that God has revealed. Uh, I think you know what I mean. I, I remember the repercussions when beloved Kathumi sent forth the series on the world teachers. I think there had been a certain uh, sense of Cold War peaceful coexistence that had gone on between ourselves and certain other organizations uh, up until that time because it was kind of like, well, we'll leave you alone if you will leave us alone. And I was personally happy with that situation. <laughs> I know Mother was too, and in one, on one level of being. And uh, it took great courage for her to take those pearls, took great courage for the masters to, to deliver them, and uh, to actually have them published and for the world to read. Because obviously, there are those who will misinterpret that as some narrow provincial uh, prejudice against everyone else and leaves, leaves the masters open to the accusation, well, you, you think you're right and everybody else and the whole planet is wrong. Of course, that's not true. If you, if you really study the teachings, you see how much of the truth of the various uh, schools that the masters have actually sponsored in past ages, how much of that is uh, acknowledged and utilized by the, by the brotherhood in this day and age. Nevertheless, that the error and the lie definitely has to be exposed. And, it, and when it comes into your hand, boy, as you cannot just sit on it because uh, it, doesn't, it just does not work. Um, and the last point of the, ob the last observation that I would want to make uh, what I say is the point I started out with. Friendship with God is enmity with the world. It's not a neutrality with the world. We can't hope for neutrality. And you might as well be reconciled to the fact that you are going to have a battle on your hands. It's been no more, nowhere more apparent to me than in the stump. We, have, we don't put up a red flag about our uh, antagonism to fundamental Christianity whenever we go around the country, at least uh, not deliberately or not in any uh, sense of incitement of those people. But everywhere we go, everywhere Mother travels and everywhere the other stump uh, people go. They are tracked and followed and badgered by those of this faith. And um, that is going to be the sign of the times, I suspect. I mean, we're going to have to uh, reconcile ourselves to that level of involvement. Not because we seek it out. Not because uh, we have any uh, jingoistic sense of wanting to, to enter into that human struggle. But when it comes to our doorstep, we know we must deal with it straightforwardly and squarely. And one of the most impor important ways of doing that 
is to expose that energy to the light of the day, to, to the light of the sun, to, to shout it from the housetops, the things that are done in secret and in the, the back corners. I would like to mention that I did place on the 12 lines of the clock certain of the false teachers. Uh, there are many, many organizations, many teachings, but I did give a series of lectures. And the fourth one is not here. Is it ever given? You, you didn't know the activity? So I can check the lecture and tell you. Yogi Bhajan, which I exposed at that time, was placed on the six o'clock line of the clock of false teachers. And I'll read them to you. Now these, the time I taught these, I felt it was far more important in the context of the teaching for individuals to be able to understand the nature of the false teacher than to just simply have a name revealed. And so I explored their methods, their means of manipulation, their false teaching, but I would not relent and give out the actual names of the people because this would not be instilling in the individual the ability to divide truth and error. These lectures you may or may not hear, depending on whether there's time to play them at your quarter of Summit University, but they are always available for you to listen to. And if you have time this weekend, you are welcome to borrow these tapes. On this clock, I place the uh, the boy guru on the 12 o'clock line and the Maharishi with his transcendental meditation. Both of these are false teachers and there's no middle ground. They do not represent the Great White Brotherhood and they do not have the path of light and they have detoured many. I gave a lecture on Sung Myung Moon. He is not on this one, but he is in the, uh, the false teachings pearls. There's the path of Ek, Ekenkar and the master Ek, which is entirely false, entirely a false hierarchy. Those in embodiment are controlled by false, false hierarchs behind the scenes and there is nothing in it whatsoever of the Great White Brotherhood. The Stell group in Chicago with its community and the claim of its leader that he was embodied as Ekanatan, entirely a false hierarchy. Scientology, entirely a false hierarchy. The Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche in Boulder, the Naropa school of Buddhism, complete false hierarchy of Gautama Buddha. Then the Yogi Bhajan, then there's Don Juan and Carlos Castaneda with the taking of mushrooms and the whole tale that is woven in those paperback books. There's Est with Werner Earhart, there's Mark Age in Florida, there's Arica, there are such little psychic groups as Mary Bethany School of Consciousness, there's the uh, focus of the Ruby Ray in Sedona, Arizona, and there's the Bridge to Freedom in Long Island. All of these groups and also the one that has to do with the uh, secrets of the Andes and the book on the Andes. All of these are misleading teachings. Also the book on uh, Urantia, false teachings. So there are many false teachings about and many offerings and much allure of a psychic nature of phenomena or promises of representations of the brotherhood. I must say, unfortunately today, the board of directors of the I Am Movement is relentless in refusing to answer our letters, inviting them to cooperate or offering ourselves in cooperation. They have steadfastly declared that I am not a real messenger and that this activity is psychic. So has the uh, Nicholas Rorick Institute, the Agni Yoga Society, declare that our work is psychic, so has Alice Bailey, uh, so have the 
theos theosophy, the theosophical movement. And so Kafumi spoke of them or uh, uh, the, in the lecture or in the dictation of the fact that these individuals who represent past dispensations consider themselves the guardians or the old guard of the original dispensation and they do not allow the evolution of the masters themselves. The fundamentalists do not allow for the magnificent evolution of Jesus Christ in 2,000 years. The Buddhists do not allow Gautama Buddha to evolve. I had people get up and challenge me who had been students of the Rinpoche uh, right in Santa Barbara who were students at Summit University left in high dudgeon because they said I was not giving the true teachings of Gautama Buddha. And Gautama Buddha was on the platform in that moment dictating to me his very teaching for the new age. It didn't happen to agree with the false teachings that had come down and been misinterpreted by those who represent Buddhism today. And so the false ones are ever about ready to challenge the new wine of the spirit, line for line on the clock. So you need to be very careful of all of these and to realize that the Ascended Master Kathumi and El Moria have indeed evolved since theosophy. The Dwal Kul made an attempt to work through Alice Bailey. She never surrendered her pride or her intellectualism, and therefore a large percentage of what is in the Alice Bailey books is entirely false uh, teaching. It is not accurate. Now I cannot tell you everything that is in those books for the simple reason that when I pick them up before I have read one third of a page, I have an intense pain in the third eye. Yesterday I tried to read a book written by a Christian, a fundamentalist Christian that someone recommended. I was very interested. The man was, looked like a nice man. His picture was on the cover. And I was very anxious to give him the benefit of the doubt, the opportunity to teach me something uh, through his prayerful experience with the Bible. I no sooner read two pages that my head was in such pain that I could not go on, and to do so would have been in disobedience to my own I am presence. So all through the years of my service, the Ascended Masters have refused to allow me to take the tremendous light they have placed in my third eye to place my attention upon the false teachings. Nevertheless, Dwal Kul entered the library at La Tourelle and told Mark and me that it was considered by the Brotherhood that the dispensation of, Gual, of Dwal Kul through Alice Bailey had failed. That Alice Bailey had failed and that the material that was collected there was not representative of the hierarchy. So that particular teaching went into the Pearls of Wisdom, the expose of false teachings, uh, and there was a tremendous outrage among people who read that and immediately crossed us off their list because we were the type of people who contemned everyone else. Well, as a matter of fact, the Alice Bailey movement for years, at least for the last 12 years, has been meeting in their triangle prayer groups and praying prayers of malintent, malintent against the messengers and students here. We are totally and thoroughly aware of that because people have come to our staff out of that movement and their parents uh, have, have been a part of the movement and know of their prayers. So it goes. There's no ground of compromise when people are using their movements to, to work their personality cult and amass their personal power. So that is the reason, paddle your own canoe. Mark and I were very generous in extending invitations to people to share our pulpit. We have done so for leaders in both church and state. And the latest people I've invited to speak from our platform was someone in the political arena. I long ago realized that I was not supposed to bring swamis and others here because of uh, what El Moria went through with us with this Swami Rama in Colorado Springs. But I still felt that I could invite people here who had not yet bent the knee and become chilas of the Ascended Masters. I have since learned that the Ascended Masters do not want people at the altar of the church addressing the church as the church who are not committed on the path. And so we had General George Keegan here who delivered his message on America and on the defense of America. 
We carried his message through his tape recording to the nations. We invited him to speak again. The first year that he came, his, his fee was about $500 and his plane fare. Then he saw that we made tapes and sold them and considered that we made so much money off of him that he wouldn't come back and speak for any less than $5,000. So for the, the address of the last 4th of July, we paid him $5,000 plus a fee for having the copyright of the address he gave. However, he never permitted us to publish the address that he gave, and he never fulfilled his commitment to present a plan, an alternative plan, for the defense of freedom in the world. Moreover, he went out of here and listened to people who criticized me and condemned me and my religion and decided that he was in a very pos bad position politically to be aligned with me in any way. And so he began to gossip against us, to speak in a very bad manner toward me, and showing me once again that if a person has not proved himself to have the courage to defend the Christ, there's no reason why I should be defending that person or giving that person our light. And so, upon numerous requests to telephone us so we could publish his final, uh, his final address that he gave, he has refused all contact whatsoever. And when our chilas and the various teaching centers try to sponsor him, taking the lead from me, he takes the opportunity to criticize our activity. So you find that much as we would like to support all kinds of leaders, at all levels of the spectrum who are standing for truth that the great white brotherhood is very serious very real their path of initiation is compromised for no one absolutely no one Archangel Michael commended the courage of General Keegan uh, in taking his stand that he took for America and when his friends heard that dictation they decided that I was a charlatan that I was trying to take advantage of my friendship with him to add to my own name. As if General Keegan's name would add anything to my name, I would never have considered such a thing. What, you know, what do I need anyone in this world to add to my own position when God has given me his mantle? But that was their viewpoint of Archangel Michael's dictation, if you can imagine. And so I realized that um, it's a non-compromising position. And when Padma Sambhava placed the mantle of the gurus upon me, he said, the law of the guru is that he may not give his light to anyone but a chila, may not stand in a relationship of friendship with anyone who is not a chila. So that is the law of my life stream. The light is so great that I only have to sit in a room with someone and that person receives so much light as, as, as a, an injection of light that they can go out and misuse. And the Great White Brotherhood is not about to have their light squandered. And so they limit my comings and goings and my appearances. And definitely uh, there is no such thing as having acquaintances for me outside of the path of chilaship. And I have so many, many, many friends who are chilas that I scarcely have time to give the time that I enjoy giving to those who are the friends of light. So I'm in no way bereft by this law, but it's a law that is absolutely uncompromising and it's proven itself again and again. So all I have to do is rest my eyes or my third eye upon energy or a teaching that is false or people who are false and instantly I feel the intense pain and the closing over of the chakras. God simply will not share his light with those who compromise. And I think that it has taken Mark and me uh, all of these years of our mission to realize what Moria really meant when he said, paddle your own canoe. And Mark often said that you cannot have an ecumenical conference of people who want to come together the only point of unity is the Christ consciousness. When they have the Christ consciousness, they will recognize you in that Christ consciousness. They will be one with you in harmony and they will not be expecting you to share your office with them as they come desirous of power, but they will come to the feet of the brotherhood and worship at the altar with you. So I think that this explanation will enable you to understand that we do not send you on a mission 
of smoking the peace pipe with all of these compromised activities. We want to give decrees and we want to give lectures that help people get free from them. But there is a world of uncommitted people. There's a world of people who are outside of these movements. And we have them to go to and to minister to. And we have full time accomplishing that task. So if you are ever in doubt or even in jeopardy concerning someone who is representing himself to be an ultimate authority, I'd be most happy to hear from you and tell you what I know. And if I don't know, I'll ask the masters. And if they don't wish to comment, I'll tell you that too. Sometimes people send me books, all kinds of books, and ask me, what do I think of it? Well, I don't have time to read them. You've got the teaching. Apply the law, discern the spirits, read between the lines, and determine. Just because there is truth in the book does not make the author a representative of the Brotherhood. All false teachers quote the truth. That is not, that is not the way of testing a true teacher or a false teacher. The only way you know them is by their fruits. Fruits are works, fruits are vibrations. The fruit of a person is what blossoms from his tree. It's his aura, his vibration, and what is he accomplishing? What is he accomplishing for people, for humanity? The Ascended Masters teach us that it's very important that we find our sufficiency in them, in the mighty I Am Presence, and that we demonstrate to the world that the mighty I Am Presence can fill all of our needs. I would like to conclude this portion of the afternoon and give you a break and invite you to return in 20 minutes. Thank you.